Chapter Seven of Farewell Nicola by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. You surely are not going to dine with Doctor Nicola in that strange house," said my wife when we were alone together that night. After what the Duke has told us, I wonder you can be so foolish. My dear girl, I answered, I don't see the force of your argument. I shan't be the first who has eaten a meal in the house in question, and I don't suppose I shall be the last. What do you think will happen to me? Do you think that we have returned to the times of the Borgias, and that Nicola will poison us? No, I am looking forward to a very enjoyable and instructive evening. While we are sitting at home wondering if the table is disappearing bodily into the vaults and taking you with it, or whether Nicola is charging the side dishes with some of his abominable chemistry, by which he will be put to sleep for three months, or otherwise experimenting upon you in the interests of what he calls science. I don't think it's at all kind of you to go. Dear girl, I answered, are you not a little unreasonable, knowing that the Martinos has but lately arrived in Venice, also that he is a friend of ours? For did he not meet him in our company? It's only natural that Nicola should desire to show him some courtesy. In spite of its decay, the Palace Ravici is an exceedingly beautiful building, and when he heard that Martinos would like to visit it, he invited him to dinner. What could be more natural? This is the nineteenth century. I'm sure I don't mind what century it is, she replied. I still adhere to what I said just now. I am sorry that you are going. In that case, I am sorry also, I answered. But as the matter stands, I fail to see how I can get out of it. I could not let the Duke and Martinos go alone. So what can I do? Oh, I suppose you will have to go, she replied ruefully. I have a presentiment, however, that trouble will result from it. With that, the subject was dropped. And it was not until the following morning, when I was smoking with Gembath after breakfast, that it cropped up again. Look here, Dick, said my companion then. What about this dinner at Nicholas' house tonight? You seem to be very keen on going last night. Are you still of the same mind this morning? Why not? I answered. My wife does not like the notion, but I am looking forward to seeing Nicola play the host. The last time I dined with him, you must remember, was in Port Said. And then the banquet could hardly be described as a pleasant one. What is more, I am anxious to see what effect Nicola and his house will produce upon our friend the Don. I wish you'd get rid of him altogether, my companion replied. I dislike the fellow more and more every time I see him. Why should you? He does you no harm. It's not that, said Glenbarth. My dislike to him is instinctive, just as one shudders when one looks into the face of a snake, or when one is repelled by a toad or a rat. In spite of his present apparent respectability, I should not be at all surprised to hear that at some period of his career he had committed murders innumerable. Nonsense, nonsense, I replied. You must not imagine such things as that. You were jealous when you first saw him because you thought he was going to come between you and Miss Trevor. You have never been able to overcome the feeling, and this continued dislike is the result. You must fight against it. Doubtless when you have seen more of him, you will like him better. I shall never like him better than I do now, he answered with conviction. As they say in the plays, my gorge rises at him. If you saw him in the light I do, you would not let Lady Hatteras. My dear fellow, I began, rising from my chair and interrupting him. This is theatrical and very ridiculous, and I assume the right of an old friend to tell you so. If you prefer not to go tonight, I'll make some excuse for you. But don't, for goodness sake, go and make things unpleasant for us all while you're there. I have no desire to do so, he replied stiffly. What is more, I am not going to let you go alone. Write your letter and accept for us both. Bother Nicola and Martinos as well. I wish they were both on the other side of the world. I thereupon wrote a note to Nicola, accepting on Glenvar's behalf and my own, his invitation to dinner for that evening. Then I dismissed the matter from my mind for the time being. An hour or so later, my wife came to see me with a serious face. I'm afraid, Dick, that there is something the matter with Gertrude, she said. She has gone to her room to lie down, complaining of a very bad headache and a numbness in all her limbs. I have done what I can for her, but if she does not get better by lunchtime, I think I shall send for a doctor. As by lunchtime she was no better, the services of an English doctor were called in. His report to my wife was certainly a puzzling one. 
he declared he could discover nothing the matter with the girl nor anything to account for the mysterious symptoms is she usually of an excitable disposition he inquired when we discussed the matter together in the drawing-room not in the least i replied i should say she is what might be called a very evenly dispositioned woman he asked one or two other questions and then took leave of us promising to call again the next day i cannot understand it at all said my wife when he'd gone gertrude seemed so well last night now she lies upon her bed and complains of this continued pain in her head and the numbness in all her limbs her hands and feet are as cold as ice and her face is as white as a sheet of notepaper during the afternoon miss trevor determined to get up only to be compelled to return to bed again her headache had left her but the strange numbness still remained she seemed incapable so my wife informed me of using her limbs the effect upon the duke may be better imagined than described his face was the picture of desolation and his anxiety was all the greater inasmuch he was precluded from giving vent to it in speech i am afraid that at this period of his life the young gentleman's temper was by no means as placid as we were accustomed to consider it he was given to flaring up without the slightest warning and to looking upon himself and his own little world in a light that was very far removed from cheerful realizing that we could do no good at home i took him out in the afternoon and was given to understand that i was quite without heart because when we had been an hour abroad i refused to return to the hotel i wonder if there's anything that miss trevor would like he said as we crossed the piazza of st mark it could be sent up to her you know in your name you might send her some flowers i answered you could then send them from yourself by jove that's the very thing you do have some good ideas sometimes thank you i said quietly approbation from sir hubert stanley is praise indeed bother your silly quotations he retorted let's get back to that flower shop we did so and thereupon that reckless youth spent upon flowers what would have kept me in cigars for a month having paid for them and given orders that they should be sent to the hotel galagati at once we left the shop when we stood outside i had to answer all sorts of questions as to whether i thought she would like them whether it would not have been better to have chosen more of one sort than another or whether the scent would not be too strong for a sick room after that he felt doubtful whether the shopkeeper would send them in time and felt half inclined to return in order to impress this fact upon the man let it be counted to me for righteousness that i bore with him patiently remembering my own feeling at a similar stage in my career when we reached the hotel on our return we discovered that the patient was somewhat better she had had a short sleep and it had refreshed her my wife was going to sit with her during the evening and knowing this i felt that we might go out with clear consciences at a quarter to seven we retired to our rooms to dress and at a quarter past the hour were ready to start when we reached the hall we found the don awaiting us he was dressed with the greatest care and presented not an unhandsome figure he shook hands cordially with me and bowed to glenbarth who had made no sign of offering him his hand previous to setting out i had extorted from that young man his promise that he would behave with courtesy toward the other during the evening you can't expect me to treat the fellow as a friend he had said in reply but i will give you my word that i will be civil to him if that's what you want and with this assurance i was perforce compelled to be content having taken our places in the gondola which was waiting for us we set off i had the pleasure of seeing dr nicola this morning said martinos as we turned into the rio del consiglio he did me the honour of calling upon me i gave a start of surprise on hearing this indeed i replied and what hour was that exactly at eleven o'clock the don answered i remember the time because i was in the act of going out when we encountered each other in the hall now it is a singular thing a coincidence if you like but it was almost on the stroke of eleven that miss trevor had been seized with her mysterious illness at a quarter past the hour she felt so poorly as to be compelled to retire to her room of course there could be no connection between the two affairs but it was certainly a coincidence of a nature calculated to afford me ample food for reflection 
a few moments later the gondola drew up at the steps of the palace ravici almost at the same instant the door opened and we entered the house the courtyard had been lighted in preparation for our coming and following the man who had admitted us we ascended the stone staircase to the corridor above and not so dismal as when i had last seen it lighted only by nikola's lantern it was still sufficiently awesome to create a decided impression upon the don you were certainly not wrong when you described it as a lonely building he said as we passed along the corridor to nikola's room as he said this the door opened and nikola stood before us he shook hands with the duke first afterwards with the don and then with myself let me offer you a hearty welcome he began pray enter we followed him into the room i have already described and the door was closed behind us it was in this apartment that i expected we should dine but i discovered that this was not to be the case the tables were still littered with papers books scientific apparatus just as when i had last seen it glenbarth seated himself in a chair by the window but i noticed that his eyes wandered continually to the oriental rug upon the floor by the fireplace he was doubtless thinking of the vaults below and as i could easily imagine wishing himself anywhere else than where he was the black cat apollyon which was curled up in an armchair regarded us for a few seconds with attentive eyes as if to make sure of our identities and then returned to his slumbers the windows were open i remember and the moon was just rising above the housetops opposite i had just gone to the casement and was looking down upon the still waters below when the tapestry of the wall on the right hand side was drawn aside by the man who admitted us to the house who informed nikola in italian that dinner was upon the table in that case let us go into it said our host perhaps your grace will be kind enough to lead the way glenbarth did as he was requested and we followed him to find ourselves in a large handsome apartment which had once been richly frescoed but was now like the rest of the palace sadly fallen to decay in the centre of the room was a small oval table well illuminated by a silver lamp which diffused a soft light upon the board the remainder of the room being in heavy shadow the decorations the napery and the glass and silver were as i could see at one glance unique three men servants awaited our coming but where they hailed from and how nikola had induced him to enter the palace i could not understand nikola as our host occupied one end of the table glenbarth being the principal guest of the evening was given the chair on his left the don took that on the right while i faced him at the further end how or by whom the dinner was cooked was another mystery nikola had told us on the occasion of our first visit that he possessed no servants and that such cooking as he required was done for him by an old man who came in once every day yet the dinner he gave us on this particular occasion was worthy of the finest chef in europe it was perfect in every particular though nikola scarcely touched anything he did the honours of his table royally and with a grace that was quite in keeping with the situation had my wife and miss trevor been present they might for all the terrors they had anticipated for us very well have imagined themselves in the dining-room of some old english country mansion waited upon by the family butler and taken into dinner by the bishop and rural dean the nikola i had seen when i had last visited the house was as distant from our present host as if he had never existed when i looked at him i could scarcely believe that he had ever been anything else but the most delightful man of my acquaintance as a great traveller don jose he said addressing our guest on his right hand you have of course dined in a great number of countries and i expect under a variety of startling circumstances now tell me what is your most pleasant recollection of a meal that which i managed to obtain after the fall of valparicio said martinos we had been without food for two days that is to say without a decent meal and i chanced upon a house where breakfast had been abandoned without being touched i can see it now ye gods it was delightful and not the less so because the old rascal we were after had managed to make his escape you were in opposition to malmasadina then said nikola quietly martinos paused for a moment before he answered yes against balmasadia he replied i wonder whether the old villain really died and if so what became of his money 
that is a question one would like to have settled concerning a good many people glenbarth put in there was that man up in the central states the republic of uh, what was its name equitina said nikola i don't know whether you remember the story you mean the fellow who shot those unfortunate young men i asked the man you were telling me of the other night the same nikola replied well he managed to fly his country taking with him something like two million dollars from that moment he has never been heard of as a matter of fact i do not suppose he ever will be after all luck has a great deal to do with things in this world permit me to pour out a libation to the god of chance said martinos he has served me well i think we can all subscribe to that said nikola you sir richard would not be the happy man you are had it not been for a stroke of good fortune which shipwrecked you on one island in the pacific instead of another you my dear duke would certainly have been drowned in bournemouth bay had not our friend hatteras chanced to be an early riser and to have taken a certain cruise before breakfast while you don martinos would in all probability not be my guest to-night had not the spaniard looked sharply at him as if he feared what he was about to hear had not what happened he asked had president balmaceda won his day was the quiet reply he did not do so however and so we four sit here to-night certainly a libation to the god of chance as the dinner came to an end and the servants withdrew having placed the wine upon the table the conversation drifted from one subject to another until it reached the history of the palace in which we were then guests but the spaniard's information nicola related it in detail he did not lay any particular emphasis upon it however as he had done upon the story he had told the duke and myself concerning the room in which he had received us he merely narrated it in a matter-of-fact way as if it were one in which he was only remotely interested yet i could not help thinking that he fixed his eyes more keenly than usual on the spaniard who sat sipping his wine and listening with an expression of polite attention upon his sallow face when the wine had been circulated for the last time nikola suggested that we should leave the dining-room and return to his own sitting-room i do not feel at home in this room he said by way of explanation for that reason i never use it i usually partake of such food as i need in the next and allow the rest of the house to fall undisturbed into that decay which you see about you with that we rose from the table and returned to the room in which he had received us a box of cigars was produced and handed round nikola made coffee with his own hands at a table in the corner and then i awaited the further developments that i knew would come presently nikola began to speak of the history of venice as i had already good reason to know he had made a perfect study of it particularly of the part played in it by the Ravici family he dealt with a particular emphasis upon the portrayal through the lion's mouth and then with an apology to glenbarth and myself for boring us with it again referred to the tragedy of the vaults below the room in which we were then seated once more he drew back the carpet and the murderous trap-door opened a cold draught suggestive of unspeakable horrors came up to us and there the starving wretch died with the moans of the woman he loved sounding in his ears from the room above said nick does it not seem that you can hear them now for my part i think they will echo throughout all eternity if he had been an actor what a wonderful tradition he would have made as he stood before us pointing down into the abyss he held us spellbound as for martinos all the accumulated superstition of the centuries seemed to be concentrated in him and he watched nicola's face as if he were fascinated beyond the power of movement come nicola began at last closing the trap-door and placing the rug upon it as he spoke you've heard the history of the house you should now do more than that you shall see it fixing his eyes upon us he made two or three passes in the air with his long white hands meanwhile it seemed to me as if he were looking into my brain i tried to avert my eyes but without success they were chained to his face and i could not remove them then an overwhelming feeling of drowsiness took possession of me i must have lost consciousness for i have no recollection of anything until i found myself in a place i thought for a moment i had never seen before yet after the time i recognised it it was a bright day in the early spring the fresh breeze coming over the islands from the open sea was rippling the water of the lagoons i looked at my surroundings i was in venice 
and yet it was not the venice with which i was familiar i was standing with nikola upon the steps of a house the building of which was well nigh completed it was a magnificent edifice and i could easily understand the pride of the owner as he stood in his gondola and surveyed it from the stretch of open water opposite he was a tall handsome man and he wore a doublet and hose shoes with large bows and a cloak trimmed with fur there was also a chain of gold suspended round his neck beside him was a man whom i rightly guessed to be the architect but presently the taller man placed his hand upon his shoulder and praised him for the work he had done vowing that it was admirable then at a signal the gondolier gave a stroke of his oar and the little vessel shot across to the steps where they landed close to where i was standing i stepped back in order that they might pass but they took no sort of notice of my presence passing on they entered the house they do not see us said nikola who was beside me let us enter and hear what the famous admiral francesco del revici thinks of his property we accordingly did so to find ourselves in a magnificent courtyard in the centre of this courtyard was a well upon which a carver in stone was putting the finishing touches to a design of leaves and fruit from here led a staircase and this we ascended in the different rooms artists were to be observed at work upon the walls depicting sea fights episodes in the history of the republic and of the famous master of the house before each the owner paused bestowing approval giving advice or suggesting such alteration or improvement as he considered needful in his company we visited the kitchens the pantler's offices and penetrated even to the dungeons below the water level then we once more ascended into the courtyard and stood at the great doors while the owner took his departure in his barge pleased beyond measure with his new abode and then the scene changed once more i stood before the house with nikola it was night but it was not dark for great cressets flared on either side of the door and a hundred torches helped to illuminate the scene all the great world of venice was making its way to the palace of Vici that night the first of the series of gorgeous fates given to celebrate the nuptials of francesco di rovici the most famous sailor of the republic who had twice defeated the french fleet and who had that day married the daughter of the duke of lovano was in progress the bridegroom was still comparatively young he was also rich and powerful the bride was one of the greatest heiresses of venice besides being one of its fairest daughters their new home was as beautiful as money and the taste of the period could make it small wonder was it therefore that the world hastened to pay court to them let us once more enter and look about us said nikola one moment i answered drawing him back a step as he was in the act of coming into collision with a beautiful girl who had just disembarked from a gondola upon the arm of a grey-haired man you need have no fear he replied you forget that we are spirits in a spirit world and that they are not conscious of our presence and indeed this appeared to be the case no one recognized us for more than once i saw people approach nikola and scarcely believable though it may seem walk through him without being the least aware of the fact on this occasion the great courtyard was brilliantly illuminated scores of beautiful figures were ascending the stairs continually while strains of music sounded from the rooms above let us ascend said nikola see the pageant there it was indeed a sumptuous entertainment and when we entered the great reception rooms no fairer scene could have been witnessed in venice i looked upon the bridegroom and his bride and recognised the former as being the man i had seen praising the architect on the skill he had displayed in the building of the palace he was more bravely attired now however than on that occasion and did the honours of his house with the ease and assurance of one accustomed to uphold the dignity of his name and position in the world his bride was a beautiful girl with a pale sweet face and eyes that had haunted one long after they had looked at them she was doing her best to appear happy before her guests but in my own heart i knew that such was not the case knowing what was before her i realised something of the misery that was weighing so heavily upon her heart surrounding her were the proudest citizens of the proudest republic of all time there was not one who did not do her honour and among the women who were her guests that night how many were there who also envied her good fortune then the scene once more changed this time the room was that with which i was best acquainted 
the same in which nikola had taken up his abode the frescoes upon the walls and ceilings were barely dry and Ravici was at sea again opposing his old enemy the french who once more threatened an attack upon the city it was towards evening and the red glow of the sunset shone upon a woman's face as she stood beside a table at which a man was writing i at once recognized her as Ravici's bride the man himself was young and handsome and when he looked up at the woman and smiled the love light shone in her eyes as it had not done when she had looked upon Ravici. there was no need for nicola to tell me that he was andrea bunapelli the artist to whose skill the room owed its paintings art thou sure twill be safe love asked the woman in a low voice as she placed her hand upon his shoulder remember tis death to bring a false accusation against a citizen of the republic and twill be worse when it is against the great Ravici. i have borne that in mind the man answered but there is naught to fear dear love the writing will not be suspected and i will drop it in the lion's mouth myself and then her only answer was to bend over and kiss him he scattered the sand upon the letter he had written and when it was dry folded it up and placed it in his bosom then he kissed the woman once more and prepared to leave the room the whole scene was so real that i could have sworn that he saw me as i stood watching him do not linger she said in farewell i shall know no peace till you return drawing aside the curtain he disappeared and then once more the scene changed a cold wind blew across the lagoon and there was a suspicion of coming thunder in the air a haggard ragged tatamedallion was standing on the steps of a small door of the palace presently it was opened to him by an ancient servant who asked his business and would have driven him away and when he had whispered something to him however the other realized that it was his master whom he thought to be a prisoner in the hands of the french then amazed beyond measure the man admitted him having before me the discovery he was about to make i looked at him with pity and when he stumbled and almost fell i hastened forward to pick him up and only clasped air at last when his servant had told him everything he followed him to a distant portion of the palace where he was destined to remain hidden for some days taking advantage of the many secret passages the palace contained and by doing so confirming his suspicions his wife was unfaithful to him and the man who had wrought his dishonour was the man to whom he had been so kind and generous a benefactor i seemed to crouch by his side time after time in the narrow passage behind the arras watching through a secret opening the love-making going on within i could see the figure beside me quiver with rage and hate until i thought he would burst in upon them and then the old servant would lead him away his finger upon his lips how many times i stood with him there i cannot say it is sufficient that at last he could bear the pain no longer and throwing open the secret door entered the room and confronted the man and woman as i write i can recall the trembling figures of the guilty pair and the woman's shriek rings in my ears even now i can see bunapelli rising from the table at which he had been seated with the death look in his face within an hour the confession of the crime they had perpetrated against Ravici had been written and signed and they were separated and made secure until the time for punishment should arrive then for the first time since he had arrived in venice he ordered his barge and set off for the council chamber to look his accusers in the face and to demand the right to punish those who had betrayed him when he returned his face was grim and set there was a look in his eyes that had not been there before he ascended to the room in which there was a trap-door in the floor and presently the wretched couple were brought before him in vain bunapelli pleaded for mercy for the woman there was no mercy to be obtained there i would have pleaded for them too but i was powerless to make myself heard i saw the great beads of perspiration that stood upon the man's brow the look of agonizing entreaty in the woman's face and the relentless decision on her husband's countenance nothing could save them now the man was torn crying to the last for mercy for her and the woman sighed the trap-door gave a click and he disappeared then they laid hands upon the woman and i saw them force open her mouth but i cannot set down the rest my tongue clove to the roof of my mouth and though i rushed forward in the hope of preventing their horrible task my efforts were as useless as before 
then with a pitiless smile still upon the husband's face the moans ascending from the vault below and the woman with the scene changed when i saw it again a stream of bright sunshine was flooding the room it was still the same apartment yet in a sense not the same frescoes were faded upon the walls there was a vast difference in the shape and make of the furniture and in certain other things but it was nevertheless the room in which francesco di rovici had taken his terrible revenge a tall and beautiful woman some thirty years of age was standing beside the window holding a letter in her hand she had finished the perusal of it and was lingering with it in her hand looking lovingly upon the signature at last she raised it to her lips and kissed it passionately then crossing to a cradle at the further end of the room she knelt beside it and looked down at the child it contained she had bent her head in prayer and was still praying when with a start i awoke and found myself sitting beside glen bath and the don in the room in which we had been smoking after dinner nicola was standing before the fireplace there was a look like that of death upon his face it was not until afterwards that the spaniard and glen bath informed me they had witnessed exactly what i had seen both however were a loss to understand the meaning of the last picture and having my own thoughts in my mind i was not to be tempted into explaining it to them that was nicola's own mother and that this house was her property and the same in which the infamous governor of the spanish colony had made his love known to her i could now see and if anything were wanting to confirm my suspicions nicola's face when my senses returned to me was sufficient to do so let me get out of this house cried the duke thickly i cannot breathe while i am in it take me away hatteras for god's sake take me away i had already risen to my feet and hastened to his side i think it better that we should be going dr nicola i said turning to our host the spaniard on his side did not utter a word he was so dazed as beyond the power of speech but nicola did not seem to comprehend what i said never before had i seen such a look upon his face his complexion was always white but now however it was scarcely human for my own part i knew what was passing in his mind but i could give no utterance to it come i said to my companions let us return to our hotel they rose and began to move mechanically towards the door the duke could scarcely reach it however before nicolo with what i could see was a violent effort recovered his self-possession you must forgive me he said in almost his usual voice i had for the moment forgotten my duties as host i fear you have had but a poor evening when we had donned our hats and cloaks we accompanied him downstairs through the house which was now as silent as the grave to the great doors upon the steps having hailed a gondola we entered it after wishing nicola good night he shook hands with glen bath and myself but i noticed that he did not offer to do so with the don then we shot out into the middle of the canal and had presently turned the corner and were making our way towards our hotel i am perfectly certain that during the journey not one of us spoke the events of the evening had proved too much for us and conversation was impossible we bade martinos good night in the hall and then the duke and i ascended to our own apartments spirits had been placed upon the table and i noticed that the duke helped himself to almost twice his usual quantity he looked as if he needed it my god dick he said did you see what happened in that room did you see that woman kneeling with her put down his glass hurriedly and walk to the window i could sympathize with him for had i not seen the same thing myself it's certain dick he said when he returned a few minutes later that were i to see much more of nicola in that house i should go mad but why did he let me see it why why for heaven's sake answer me how could i tell him the thought that was in my own mind how could i reveal to him the awful fear that was slowly but surely taking possession of me why had nicola invited the don to his house why had he shown him the picture of that terrible crime like glen bath i could only ask the same question why 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 End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Farewell Nicola by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Chapter 8 Before Glenbarth and I parted on the terrible evening described in the previous chapter, we had made a contract with each other to say nothing about what we had seen to the ladies. For this reason, when my wife endeavoured to interrogate me concerning our entertainment, I furnished her with an elaborate description of the dinner itself, spoke of the marvellous cooking, and I hope gave her a fairly accurate account of the menu, or rather so much of it as I could remember. I suppose I must confess to defeat, then, she said, when I had exhausted my powers of narration. I had settled the conviction that something out of the common would have occurred. You seem simply to have had a good dinner, to have smoked some excellent cigars, and the rest to have been bounded merely by the commonplace. For once, I fear, Dr. Nicola has not acted up to his reputation. If she had known the truth, I wonder what she would have said. Long after she had bade me good night, I lay awake, ruminating on the different events of the evening. The memory of what I had seen in that awful room was still as fresh with me as if I were still watching it. And yet I asked myself, why should I worry so much about it? Nicola had willed that his audience should see certain things. We had done so. It was no more concerned with the supernatural than I was myself. Any man who had the power could have impressed us in the same way. But though I told myself all this, I must confess that I was by no means convinced. I knew in my heart that the whole thing had been too real to be merely a matter of make-believe. No human brain could have invented the ghastly horrors of that room in such complete detail. Even to think of it now is to bring the scene almost too vividly before me. And when I lay awake at night, I seem to hear the shrieks of the wretched woman and the moans of the man perishing in the vaults below. On my retiring to rest, my wife had informed me that she fancied Miss Trevor had been slightly better that evening. She had slept peacefully for upwards of an hour and seemed to be much refreshed by it. Her maid is going to spend the night in her room, said Phyllis. I have told her that if she sees any change in Gertrude's condition, she is to let me know at once. I do hope that she may be herself again tomorrow. This, however, was unhappily not destined to be the case. For a little before three o'clock there was a tapping upon our bedroom door. Guessing who it would be, my wife went to it, and having opened it a little, was informed that Miss Trevor was worse. I must go to her at once, said Phyllis, and having clothed herself warmly, for the night was cold, she departed to our guest's room. I am really afraid there is something very serious the matter with her, she said, when she returned after about a quarter of an hour's absence. She is in a high state of fever, and is inclined to be delirious. Do you think we'd better send for the doctor? I will have a messenger dispatched to him at once if you think it necessary, I returned. Poor girl, I wonder what on earth it can be. Perhaps the doctor will be able to tell us now, said my wife. The symptoms are more fully developed, and he should be surely able to make his diagnosis. But I must not stay here talking, I must go back to her. When she had departed, I dressed myself and went down to the hall in search of the night watchman. He undertook to find a messenger to go and fetch the doctor, and when I had seen him dispatched on his errand, I returned to the drawing-room and switched on the electric light, and tried to interest myself in a book until the medico should arrive. I was not very successful, however, for interesting though I was given to understand the book was, I found my thoughts continually leaving it and returning to the house in the Rio del Consiglio. I wondered what Nicola was doing at that moment and I fancied I could picture him still at work, late though the hour was. At last, tiring of the book, and wanting something else to occupy my thoughts, I went to the window and drew back the shutters. It was a beautiful morning, and the myriad stars overhead were reflected in the black waters of the canal like lamps of a large town. Not a sound was to be heard. It might have been a city of the dead. So still was it. As I stood looking across the water, I thought of the city's past history, of her ancient grandeur, of her wondrous art, and of the great men who had been her children. There was a tremendous lesson to be learnt from her fall, if one could only master it. I was interrupted in my reverie by the entrance of the doctor, whom I had told the night watchman to conduct to my presence immediately upon his arrival. I am sorry to bring you out this time of night, doctor, I said. But the fact is, Miss Trevor is much worse. My wife spent the greater part of the evening with her, and informed me on my return from her dinner that she was better three-quarters of an hour ago. 
However, her maid, who had been sleeping in her room, came to us with the news that a change for the worst had set in. This being the case, I thought I'd better send for you at once. You did quite right, my dear sir, quite right, the medico replied. There is nothing like promptness in these matters. Perhaps I'd better see her without further delay. With that, I conducted him to the door of Miss Trevor's room. He knocked upon it, was admitted by my wife, and then disappeared from my gaze. Something like half an hour elapsed before he returned to me in the drawing room. When he did so, his face looked grave and troubled. What do you think of her condition now, doctor? I asked. She is certainly in a state of high fever, he answered. Her pulse is very high. She is inclined to be delirious. At the same time, I am bound to confess to you that I am at a loss to understand the reason of it. The case puzzled me considerably yesterday, but I am even more puzzled by it now. There are various symptoms that I can neither account for nor explain. One thing, however, is quite certain. The young lady must have a trained nurse, and with your permission I shall see that one comes in after breakfast. Lady Hatteras is not strong enough for the task. I am quite with you there, I answered, and I am vastly obliged to you for putting your foot down. At the same time, will you tell me whether you deem it necessary for me to summon her father from England? So far as I can see at present, I do not think there is any immediate need, he replied. Should I see any reason for so doing, I would at once tell you. I have given a prescription to Lady Hatteras, and furnished her with the name of a reliable chemist. I shall return between nine and ten o'clock, and shall hope to have better news for you then. I sincerely trust you, may I said, and as you may suppose, her illness has been a great shock to us. I then escorted him downstairs and afterwards returned to my bedroom. The news which he had given me of Miss Trevor's condition was most distressing, and made me feel more anxious than I cared to admit. At seven o'clock I saw my wife for a few minutes, but, as before, she had no good news to give me. She's quite delirious now, she said, and talks continually of some great trouble which she fears is going to befall her. It implores me to help her to escape from it, but will not say definitely what it is. It goes to my heart to hear her, and to know that I cannot comfort her. You must be careful what you are doing, I replied. The doctor has promised to bring a trained nurse with him after breakfast, who will relieve you of the responsibility. And it is, in a way, encouraging to know that so far he does not think there is any necessity for such an extreme step. In the meantime, however, I think I will write to the dean and tell him how matters stand. It will prepare him, but I'm afraid it will give the poor old gentleman a sad fright. It could not give him a greater fright than it has done us, said Phyllis. I do not know why I should do so, but I cannot help thinking that I am to blame in some way. What nonsense, my dear girl, I replied. I'm sure you have nothing whatsoever to reproach yourself with. Far from it, you must not worry yourself about it, or we shall be having you upon our hands before long. You must remember that you are yourself far from strong. Oh, I'm quite myself again now, she answered. It is only on account of your anxiety that I treat myself as an invalid. Then she added, I wonder what the Duke will say when he hears the news. He was very nearly off his head yesterday, I answered. He will be neither to hold or to bind today. She was silent for a few moments. Then she said thoughtfully, Do you know, Dick, it may seem strange to you, but I do not mind saying that I attribute all this trouble to Nicola. Good gracious, I cried, in well-simulated amazement. Why on earth to Nicola? Because as was the case five years ago, it has been all trouble since we met him. You remember how he affected Gertrude at the onset. She was far from being herself on the night of our tour through the city, and now in her delirium she talks continually of this dreadful house, and for what she says and the way she behaves, I cannot help feeling inclined to believe that she imagines herself to be seeing some of the dreadful events which have occurred or are occurring in it. God help her, I said to myself, and then I continued aloud to my wife, Doubtless that Nicola's extraordinary personality is affected her in some measure, as it does other people. But you are surely not going to jump to the conclusion that because she has spoken to him, he is necessarily responsible for her illness. That would be the wildest flight of fancy. And yet, do you know, she continued, I have made a curious discovery. What is that? I asked, not without some asperity, or having so much on my mind I was not in the humour for fresh discoveries. She paused for a moment before she replied. Doubtless she expected that I would receive it with scepticism, 
if not with laughter and phyllis ever since i have known her has a distinct fear of ridicule you may laugh at me if you please she said yet the coincidence is too extraordinary to be left unnoticed did you happen to be aware dick that dr nikola called at this hotel at exactly eleven o'clock i almost betrayed myself in surprise this was the last question i expected her to put to me yes i answered with an endeavour to appear calm i do happen to be aware of that fact he merely paid a visit of courtesy to the don prior to the others accepting his hospitality i see nothing remarkable in that i did the same myself if you remember of course i know that she replied but there is more to come are you aware that it was at the very moment of his arrival in the house gertrude was taken ill what do you think of that she put this question to me with an air of triumph as if it were one that no argument on my part could refute at any rate i did not attempt the task i think nothing of it i replied you may remember that you once fell down in a dead faint within a few minutes of the vicar's arrival at our house at home would you therefore have me suppose that it was on account of his arrival that you were taken ill why should you attribute miss trevor's illness to nicholas courtesy to our friend the don i beg that you will not call him our friend said phyllis with considerable dignity i do not like the man i did not tell her that the duke was equally outspoken concerning our companion i could see that they would put their heads together and that trouble would be the inevitable result like a wise husband i held my peace knowing that whatever i might say would not better the situation half an hour later it was my unhappy lot to have to inform glenbarth of miss trevor's condition I told you yesterday that it was a matter not to be trifled with he said as if i were personally responsible for her grave condition the doctor evidently doesn't understand the case and what you ought to do if you have any regard for her life is to send a telegram at once to london ordering competent advice the dean of bedminster had a salary of eight hundred pounds per annum i answered quietly such a man as you would want me to send for would require a fee of some hundreds of guineas to make such a journey and you would allow her to die for the sake of a few paltry pounds he cried good heavens dick i never thought you were a money grabber i am glad that you did not i answered for it is of her father that i am thinking besides i do not know that the doctor here is as ignorant as you say he has a most complicated and unusual case to deal with and i honour him for admitting the fact that he does not understand it many men in his profession would have thrown dust in her eyes and pretended to have a perfect knowledge of the case the young man did not see it in the light that i did and was plainly of the opinion that we were not doing what we might for the woman he loved my wife however took him in hand after breakfast and talked quietly but firmly to him she succeeded where i had failed when i returned from an excursion to the chemist where i had the prescriptions made up i found him in a tolerably reasonable frame of mind a quarter to ten the doctor put in an appearance once more and after a careful inspection of his patient informed me that it was his opinion that a consultant should be called in this was done and to our dismay the result came no nearer elucidating the mystery than before the case was such a one as had never entered into the experience of either man to all intents and purposes there was nothing that would in any way account for the patient's condition the fever had left her she complained of no pain while her mind save for the occasional relapses was clear enough they were certain it was not a case of paralysis yet she was incapable of moving or of doing anything to help herself the duration of her illness was not sufficient to justify her extreme weakness nor to account for the presence of certain other symptoms there was nothing for it therefore but for us to possess our souls in patience and to wait the turn of events when the doctors had departed i went in search of glenbarth and gave him their report the poor fellow was far from being consoled by it he had hoped to receive good news and their inability to give a satisfactory decision only confirmed his belief in their incompetency had i permitted him to do so he would have telegraphed at once for the best medical advice in europe and would have expended half his own princely revenues in an attempt to make her herself once more it was difficult to convince him that he had not the right to heap liabilities on the old gentleman's shoulders which in honour bound he would feel he must repay 
I will not bore my readers with the abusive arguments against society and social etiquette with which he favoured me in reply to my speech. The poor fellow was beside himself with anxiety, and it was difficult to make him understand that because he had not placed a narrow band of gold upon a certain pretty finger, he was debarred from saving the life of the owner of that self-same finger. Towards nightfall it was certain that Miss Trevor's condition was gradually going from bad to worse. With the closing of the day, the delirium had returned, and the fever had also come with it. We spent a wretchedly anxious night, and in the morning, at the conclusion of his first visit, the doctor informed me that, in his opinion, it would be advisable that I should telegraph to the young lady's father. This was an extreme step, and, needless to say, it caused me great alarm. It was all so sudden that it was scarcely possible to realise the extent of the calamity. Only two days before, Miss Trevor had been as well as any of us, and certainly in stronger health than my wife. Now she was lying, if not at death's door, at least no great distance from that grim portal. Immediately this sad intelligence was made known to me, I hastened to the telegraph office and dispatched a message to the dean, asking him to come with us at all possible speed. Before luncheon I received a reply to the effect that he already started and then we sat ourselves down to wait and to watch, hoping almost against hope that this beautiful, happy young life might be spared to us. All this time we had seen nothing of the Don or of Nicola. The former, however, had heard of Miss Trevor's illness and sent polite messages as to her condition. I did not tell Glenbarth of this, for the young man had sufficient to think of just then without my adding to his worries. I must pass on now to describe to you the arrival of the Dean of Bedminster in Venice. Feeling that he would be anxious to question me concerning his daughter's condition, I made a point of going to meet him alone. Needless to say, he was much agitated on seeing me, and implored me to give him the latest bulletin. God's will be done, he said quietly when he had heard all I had to tell him. I did not receive your letter, he remarked, as we made our way from the station in the direction of Galagatti's Hotel so that you will understand that I know nothing of the nature of poor Gertrude's illness. What does the doctor say is the matter with her? I then informed him of how the case stood, and of the uncertainty felt by the two members of the medical profession I had called in. Surely that is very singular, is it not? he asked, when I had finished. There are not many diseases left that they are unable to diagnose. In this case, however, I fear they are at a loss to name it, I said. However, you'll be able very soon to see her for yourself, and to draw your own conclusions. The meeting between the worthy old gentleman and his daughter was on his side, affecting in the extreme. She did not recognise him, nor did she know my wife. When he joined me in the drawing-room a quarter of an hour or so later, his grief was pitiful to witness. While we were talking, Glen Bath entered, and I introduced them to each other. The dean knew nothing of the latter's infatuation for his daughter, but I fancy after a time he must have guessed that there was something in the wind from the other's extraordinary sympathy with him in his trial. As it happened, the old gentleman had not arrived any too soon. That afternoon Miss Trevor was decidedly worse, and the medical men expressed their gravest fears for her safety. All that day and the next we waited in suspense, but there was no material change. Nature was fighting her battle stubbornly, inch by inch. The girl did not seem any worse, nor were there any visible improvement. On the doctor's advice, a third physician was called in, but with no greater success than before. Then, one never-to-be-forgotten afternoon, the first doctor took me to one side and informed me that in his opinion and those of his colleagues, it would not be wise to cherish any further hopes. The patient was undeniably weaker, and was growing more so every hour. With a heart surcharged with sorrow, I went to the dean's room and broke the news to him. The poor man heard me out in silence, and then walked to the window and looked down upon the Grand Canal. After a while he turned and, coming back to me once more, laid his hand upon my arm. If it is the Lord's will that I lose her, what can I do but submit, he said. When shall I be allowed to see her? I'll make inquiries, I answered, and hastened away in search of the doctor. As I passed along the passage, I met Galagatti. The little man had been deeply grieved to hear the sad intelligence, and hastened in search of me at once. My lord, he said, 
for do what i would i could never cure him of the habit believe me it is not so hopeless though they say so if you will but listen to me there is dr nicola your friend he could cure her if you went to him did he not cure my child i gave a start of surprise i will confess that the idea had occurred to me but i had never given the probability of putting it into execution a thought why should it not be done Gallagetti had reminded me how nicola had cured his child when she lay at the point of death and the other doctors of venice had given her up he was so enthusiastic in his praises of the doctor that i felt almost inclined to risk it when i reached the drawing-room glenbarth hastened towards me what news he inquired his anxiety showing itself plainly upon his face i shook my head for god's sake don't trifle with me he cried you can have no idea what i am suffering feeling that it would be better if i told him everything i made a clean breast of it he heard me out before he spoke she must not die he said with the fierceness of despair if there is any power on earth that can be invoked it should be brought to bear can you not think of anything try remember that every second is of importance would it be safe to try nicola i inquired looking at him steadfastly in the face galaghetti is wild for me to do so in spite of his dislike to nicola glenbarth jumped at the suggestion as a drowning man clutches at a straw find him at once he cried seizing me by the arm if anyone can save her he is the man let's go to him without a moment's delay no no i answered that will never do even in a case of such gravity the proprieties must be observed i must consult the doctors before calling in another i regret very much to say that here the duke made use of some language that was neither parliamentary nor courteous to those amiable gentlemen i sought them out and placed the matter before them the idea of calling in a fourth consultant they had not the least objection though they were all of the opinion it could do no good when however i mentioned the fact that this consultant's name was nicola i could plainly see that a storm was rising gentlemen i said you must forgive me if i speak plainly and to the point you have given us to understand that your patient's case is hopeless now i have had considerable experience of dr nicholas skill and i feel that we should not be justified in withholding him from our counsel if he will consent to be called in i have no desire to act contrary to medical etiquette but we must remember that the patient's life comes before aught else one doctor looked at the other and all shook their heads i fear said the tallest of them who invariably acted as spokesman that if the services of the gentleman in question are called in it will be necessary for my colleagues and myself to abandon our interest in the case i do not of course know how far your knowledge extends but i hope you will allow me to say sir that the most curious stories are circulated both as to the behaviour and attainments of this dr nicola and we knew it to be true his words nettled me and yet i had such a deeply rooted belief in nicola although they were determined to give up the case that i felt we should be equally if not more powerful without them i sincerely hope gentlemen i said that you will not do as you propose nevertheless i feel that i should not be myself acting rightly if i were to allow your professional prejudices to stand in the way of my friend's recovery in that case i fear there is nothing left to us but to most reluctantly withdraw said one of the men you are determined quite determined they replied together then the tallest added we much regret it but our decision is irrevocable ten minutes later they had left the hotel in a huff and i found myself seated upon the horns of a serious dilemma what would my position be if nicola's presence should exercise a bad effect upon the patient or if he should decline to render us his assistance in that case i should have offended the best doctors in venice and should in all probability have killed her it was a nice position to be placed in one thing however was as certain as anything could be and that was the fact that there was no time to lose my wife was seriously alarmed when i informed her of my decision but both glenbarth and i felt that we were acting for the best and the dean sided with us since you deem it necessary to go in search of dr nicola at once said my wife when the latter had left us implore him to come without delay in another hour it may be too late then in a heartbroken whisper she added she's growing weaker every moment oh dick heaven grant that we're not acting wrongly and he may be able to save her i feel convinced that we're doing right i answered 
but now i will go in search of nikola and if possible bring him back with me god grant that you may be successful in your search said glenbarth wringing my hand if nikola saves her i will do anything he may ask and still be grateful to him all the days of my life then i set off upon my errand End of chapter eight Chapter nine of Farewell Nicola by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine. With a heart as heavy as lead, I made my way downstairs, and having chartered a gondola, bade the man take me to the Palace Ravici with all possible haste. Old Galaghetti, who stood upon the steps, nodded vehement approval, and rubbed his hands with delight as he thought of the triumph his great doctor must inevitably achieve. As I left the hotel, I looked back at it with a feeling of genuine sorrow. Only a few days before, our party had all been so happy together, and now one was stricken down with a mysterious malady that, so far as I could see, was likely to end in her death. Whether the gondolier had been admonished by Galagatti to make haste, and was anxious to do so in sympathy with my trouble, I cannot say. The fact, however, remains that we accomplished the distance that separated the hotel from the palace in what could have been little more than half the time usually taken. My star was still in the ascendant when we reached the palace, for when I had disembarked at the steps, the old man who did menial service for Nicola had just opened it and looked out. I inquired whether his master was at home, and if so, whether I could see him. He evidently realised that my Italian was one of the most rudimentary description for it was necessary for me to repeat my question three or four times before he could comprehend my meaning. When at last he did so, he pointed up the stairs to signify that Nicola was at home, and also that if I desired to see him, I had better go in search of him. I immediately did so, and hastened up the stairs to the room I have already described, and of which I entertained such ghastly recollections. I knocked upon the door, and a well-known voice bade me in English to come in. I was in too great a haste to fulfil my mission to observe at the time the significance that these words contain. It was not until afterwards that I remembered the fact that as we approached the palace I had looked up at Nicola's window and had seen no sign of him there, and as I had not rung the bell but had been admitted by the old man's servant, how could he have become aware of my presence? But as I say, I thought of all that afterwards. For the moment, the only desire I had was to inform Nicola of my errand. Upon entering the room, I found Nicola standing before a table, on which were glasses, test tubes, and various chemical paraphernalia. He was engaged in pouring some dark-coloured fluid into a graduating glass, and when he spoke, it was without looking round at me. I am very glad to see you, my dear Hatteras, he said. It is kind of you to take pity on my loneliness, if you don't mind sitting down for a few moments and lighting a cigar you'll find a box on the table. I shall have finished this, and then we can talk. But I'm afraid I can't wait, I answered. I've come on the most important business. There's not a moment to lose. In that case, I am supposed that Miss Trevor is worse, he said, putting down the bottle from which he'd been pouring, and afterwards replacing the glass stopper with the same hand. I was afraid it might be so. How do you know that she is ill? I asked, not a little surprised to hear that he was aware of our trouble. I managed to know a good many things, he replied. I was aware that she was ill, and had been wondering how long it would be before I was called in. The other doctors don't like my interference, I suppose. They certainly do not, I answered. They have done no good for her. And you think I may be able to help you, he inquired, looking at me over the graduating glass with his strange, dark eyes. I certainly do, I replied. I am your debtor for the compliment. And you will come? You really wish it? I believe it's the only thing that will save her life, I answered. But you must come quickly, or it'll be too late. She was sinking when I left the hotel. With a hand that never shook, he poured the contents of the glass into a small file and then placed the latter in his pocket. I am at your disposal now, he answered. We will set off as soon as you like. As you say, we must lose no time. But will it not be necessary for you to take some drugs with you, I asked? I am taking this one, he replied, placing his hat upon his head as he spoke. I remembered that he had been making his prescription up as I entered the room. Had he then intended calling to see her, even supposing I had not come to ask his assistance? 
I had no chance of putting the question to him, however. Have you a gondola below? he asked as we went down the stairs. I replied in the affirmative, and when we gained the hall door, we descended the steps and took our places in it. On reaching the hotel, I conducted him to the drawing room where we found the Dean and Glen Bath eagerly awaiting our coming. I presented the former to Nicola and then went off to inform my wife of his arrival. She accompanied me back to the drawing room, and when she entered the room, Nicola crossed it to receive her. Though she looked at him in a frightened way, I thought his manner soon put her at her ease. Perhaps you will be kind enough to take me to my patient, he said when they had greeted each other. As the case is so serious, I had better lose no time in seeing her. He followed my wife from the room, and then we sat down to await his verdict, with what anxiety you may imagine. Of all that transpired during his stay with Miss Trevor, I can only speak from hearsay. My wife, however, was unfortunately too agitated to remember everything that occurred. She informed me that on entering the room he advanced very quietly towards the bed, and for a few moments stood looking down at the frail burden it supported. Then he felt her pulse, lifted the lids of her eyes, and for a space during which a man might have counted fifty slowly, he laid his hand upon her forehead. Then turning to the nurse, who had of course heard of the withdrawal of the other doctors, he bade her bring him a wine glass of iced water. She disappeared, and while she was absent, Nicola sat by the bedside, holding the sick girl's hand, and never for a moment taking his eyes from her face. Presently the woman returned, bringing the water as directed. He took it from her, and going to the window, poured from a phial, which he had taken from his pocket some twenty drops of the dark liquid it contained. Then with a spoon he gave her nearly half of the contents of the glass. This done, he once more seated himself beside the bed, and waited patiently for the result. Several times within the next half hour he bent over the recumbent figure, and was evidently surprised at not seeing some change which he expected would take place. At the end of that time he gave her another spoonful of the liquid, and once more sat down to watch. When an hour had passed, he permitted a sigh of satisfaction to escape him. In turning to my wife, whose anxiety was plainly expressed upon her face, he said, I think, Lady Hatteras, that you may tell them that she will not die. There is still much to be done, but I pledge my word that she will live. The reaction was too much on my wife. She felt as if she were choking. Then she turned giddy and was at last possessed with a frantic desire to cry. Softly leaving the room, she came in search of us. The moment that she opened the door of the drawing-room, and I looked upon her face, I knew that there was good news for us. "'What does he say about her?' cried the Duke, forgetting the Dean's present, while the latter rose and drew a step nearer without speaking a word. "'There is good news,' she said, fumbling with her handkerchief in a suspicious manner. "'Dr. Nicholas says she will live.' "'Thank God,' we all said in one breath and Glenbarth murmured something more that I did not catch. So implicit was our belief in Nicola, that, as you have doubtless observed, we accepted his verdict without a second thought. I kissed my wife, and then shook hands solemnly with the Dean. The Duke had meanwhile vanish, presumably to his own apartment, where he could meditate on certain matters undisturbed. After that, Phyllis left us and returned to the sick room, where she found Nicola still seated beside the bed, just as she had left him. So far as she could judge, Miss Trevor did not appear to be any different, though perhaps she did not breathe as heavily as she had hitherto done. Nicola, however, appeared to be well satisfied. He nodded approvingly to Phyllis as she entered, and then returned to his contemplation of his patient once more. In this fashion, hour after hour went by. Once during each, my wife would come to me with reassuring bulletins. Miss Trevor was, if anything, a little better. She did not seem so restless as before. The fever seems to be abating. And then towards nine o'clock that night, at last Gertrude was sleeping peacefully. It was not, however, until nearly midnight that Nicola himself made his appearance. The worst is over, he said, approaching the Dean. Your daughter is now asleep and will only require watching for the next two hours. At the end of that time I shall return and shall hope to find... A decided improvement in her condition. I can never thank you enough, my dear sir, said the worthy old clergyman, shaking the other by the hand while the tears ran down his wrinkled cheeks. But for your wonderful skill, there can be no sort of doubt that she will be lost to us now. 
she is my only child my ewe lamb and may heaven bless you for your goodness to me i thought nikola looked at him rather curiously as he said this it was the first time i had seen nikola brought into the society of a dignitary of the english church and i was anxious to see how the pair comported themselves under the circumstances a couple more diametrically opposed could be scarcely imagined they were as oil and water and could scarcely be expected to assimilate sir i should have been less than human if i had not done everything possible to save that beautiful young life said nikola with what was to me the suggestion of a double meaning in his speech and now you must permit me to bid you good-bye for the present in two hours i shall return again thinking he might prefer to remain near his patient i pressed him to stay at the hotel offering to do all that lay in my power to make him comfortable but he would not hear of such a thing as you should be aware by this time i never rest away from my own house he answered in a tone that settled the matter once and for all if anything should occur in the meantime send for me and i will come at once i do not apprehend any change however when he had gone i went in search of the duke and found him in his own room dick he said look at me and tell me if you can see any difference i feel as though i had passed through years of suffering another week would have made an old man of me how is she now progressing famously i answered you need not look so sceptical for this must surely be the case since nikola has gone home to take some rest and will not return for two hours he wrung my hand on hearing this how little i dreamt he said when we were confined in that wretched room in port said and when he played that trick upon me in sydney that some day he was destined to do me the greatest service any man has ever done me in my life didn't i tell you that those other medicos did not know what they were doing and that nikola is the greatest doctor in the world i admitted that he had given me the first assurance but i was not so certain about the latter then realizing how he must be feeling i proposed that we should row down the canal for a breath of fresh sea air at first the duke was for refusing the invitation eventually however he assented and when we had induced the dean to accompany us we set off when we reached the hotel once more it was to discover that nikola had returned and that he had again taken up his watch in the sick room he remained there all night passing hour after hour at the bedside without so my wife asserted moving save to give the medicine and without apparently feeling the least fatigue it was not until between seven and eight o'clock the next morning that i caught a glimpse of him he was in the dining room then partaking of a small cup of black coffee into which he had poured some curious decoction of his own for my part i have never yet been able to discover how nikola managed to keep body and soul together on his frugal fare how is the patient this morning i asked when we had greeted each other out of danger he replied slowly stirring his coffee as he spoke she will continue to progress now i hope you are satisfied that i have done all i can in her interests i am more than satisfied i answered i am deeply grateful as her father said yesterday if it had not been for you nikola she must inevitably have succumbed she will have cause to bless your name for the remainder of her existence he looked at me very curiously as i said this do you think she will do that he asked with unusual emphasis do you think it will please her to remember that she owes her life to me i'm sure she will always be deeply grateful i replied somewhat ambiguously i fancy you know that yourself and your wife what does she say she thinks you are certainly the greatest of all doctors i answered with a laugh i feel that i ought to be jealous but strangely enough i'm not and yet i have done nothing so very wonderful he continued almost as if he were talking to himself but that those other blind worms are content to go on digging in their mud and they should be seeking the light in another direction they could do as much as i have done by the way have you seen our friend don martinos since you dined together at my house i replied to the effect that i had not done so but reported that the don had sent repeated messages of sympathy to us during miss trevor's illness i then inquired whether nikola had seen him i saw him yesterday morning he replied we devoted upwards of four hours to exploring the city together i could not help wondering how the don had enjoyed the excursion but needless to remark i did not say anything on this score to my companion that night nikola was again in attendance upon his patient next day she was decidedly better she recognized her father and my wife 
and every hour was becoming more and more like her former self was she surprised when she gained consciousness to find nicola at her bedside i inquired of phyllis when the great news was reported to me strangely enough she was not phyllis replied i fully expected remembering my previous suspicions they would have a bad effect upon her they did nothing of the kind it was just as if she had expected to find him there and what were his first words to her i hope you are feeling better miss trevor he said she replied much better that was all it was as commonplace as could be next day nicola only looked in twice the day after once and at the end of the week informed me that she stood in no further need of his attention how shall we ever be able to reward you nicola i asked for about the hundredth time as we stood together in the corridor outside the sick room i have no desire to be rewarded he answered it is enough for me to see miss trevor restored to health endeavour if you can to recall a certain conversation we had together respecting the lady in question on the evening that i narrated to you the story concerning the boy who was so badly treated by the spanish governor did i not tell you then that our destinies were inextricably woven together i informed you that it had been revealed to me many years ago that we should meet should you feel surprised therefore if i told you that i had also been warned of this illness once more i found myself staring at him in amazement you are surprised believe me however astonishing it may seem it is quite true i knew that miss trevor would come into my life i knew also that it would be my lot to save her from death what is more i know that in the end one thing which has seemed to me most desirable in life will be taken from me by her hands i'm afraid i cannot follow you i said perhaps not but you will be able to some day he answered that moment has not yet arrived in the meantime watch and wait for before we know it it will be upon us then with a look that was destined to haunt me for many a long day he bade me farewell and left the hotel end of chapter nine chapter ten of farewell nicola by guy boothby this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten to the joy of every one by the thursday following miss trevor was sufficiently recovered to be able to leave her room it was a happy day for every one concerned particularly for the duke who came nearer presenting the appearances of an amiable lunatic on that occasion than i had ever seen him before why my wife should have encouraged him in his extravagance i cannot say but the fact remains that she allowed him to go out with her that morning with a professed idea of purchasing a few flowers to decorate the drawing-room for the invalid's reception so great was their extravagance that the room more resembled a hothouse or a flower show than a civilized apartment i pointed this out to my wife with a gentle remonstrance i was informed that being a mere husband i knew nothing at all about the matter i trust that i preserved my balance and lived up to my reputation for sanity in the midst of this general excitement though i am prepared to confess that i was scarcely myself when the triumphal procession consisting of my wife and the dean set off to the invalid's apartment to escort her in when she appeared it was like a ghost of her former self and a poor wan ghost too her father of course she had already seen but neither i nor glenbarth had of course had the honour of meeting her since she was taken ill she received him very graciously and was kind enough to thank me for the little i had done for her we seated her between us in a comfortable chair placed a footstool under her feet and then in order that she should not have too much excitement and that she might rest quietly the dean the duke and myself were sent about our business for an hour when we returned a basket of exquisite roses stood on the table and on examining it the card of don jose de martinos was found to be attached to it it is some proof of the anxiety that glenbarth felt not to do anything that might worry her when i say that he read the card and noted the giver without betraying the least trace of annoyance it is true that he afterwards furnished me with his opinion of the giver for presuming to send them but the casual observer would have declared that had he been present to observe the manner in which he behaved when he had first seen the gift that he had taken no interest in the matter at all the next day miss trevor was permitted to get up a little earlier and on the day following a little earlier still 
in the meantime more flowers had arrived from the don while he himself had twice made personal inquiries as to the progress she was making it was not until the third day of her convalescence that nikola called to see his patient i was sitting alone with her at the time my wife and our other two guests having gone shopping in the masseria i was idly cutting a copy of a tochnis publication that i procured for her on the previous day the weather was steadily growing warmer and for this reason the windows were open and a flood of brilliant sunshine was streaming into the room on the canal outside came the sounds of rippling laughter and an unmistakably american voice called out say girls what do you think of venice now you're here and then another voice replied plenty of water about but they don't seem to wash their buildings much miss trevor was about to speak in fact she had opened her lips to do so when a strange expression appeared upon her face she closed her eyes for a moment and i began to fear that she was ill when she opened them again i was struck by a strange fact that the eyes were certainly there but there was no sort of life in them they were like those of a sleepwalker who while his eyes are open sees nothing of things about him a moment later there was a knock at the door and dr nikola escorted by a servant entered the room wishing us good morning he crossed the room and shook hands with miss trevor afterwards with myself you're certainly looking better he said addressing his patient and placing his finger and thumb upon her wrist as he spoke i am much better she answered but for some reason without her usual animation in that case i think this will be the last visit i shall pay you in my professional capacity he said you've been an excellent patient and in the interest of what our friend sir richard here calls science permit me to offer you my grateful thanks it is i who should thank you she answered as if she were repeating some lesson she had learnt by heart i trust then on the principle that one seldom or never acts as one should that you will not do it he replied with a smile i am amply rewarded by observing that the flush of health is returning to your cheeks he then inquired after my wife's health bade me be careful of her for the reasons that since i had behaved so outrageously towards them no other doctors in venice would attend her should she be taken ill and then rose to bid us adieu it's a very short visit i said cannot we persuade you to give us a little more of your society i fear not he answered i am developing quite a practice in venice and my time is no longer my own you have other patients i asked in some surprise for i did not think he would condescend to such a thing i have your friend don martinos now upon my hands he said the good galaghetti is so abominably grateful for what i did for his child that he will insist on trying to draw me into experimenting upon other people would it be indiscreet to ask what is the matter with the don i said he does not look like a man who would be likely to be an invalid i did not think there was so very much wrong with him nikola replied vaguely at any rate it is not anything that can be very easily put right when he left the room i accompanied him down the corridor as far as the hall the fact of the matter is he began when we were alone together our friend the don has been running the machinery of life a little too fast of late i am told that he lost no less a sum than fifty thousand pounds in english money last week and certainly his nerves are not what they once were is he a gambler then i said an inveterate gambler i should say nicola answered and when a spaniard takes to that sort of amusement he generally does it most thoroughly whatever the don's illness may have been it had certainly made its mark upon his appearance i chanced to meet him that afternoon on the rialto bridge and was thunderstruck at the change the man's face was white and his eyes had dark rings under them and to my thinking spoke for an enfeebled heart when he stopped to speak to me i noticed that his hands trembled as though he were afflicted with st vitus's dance i hope miss trevor is better he said after i had commented upon the fact that i had not seen him of late much better i answered in fact she may be now said to be convalescent i was sorry to hear from dr nicola however that you yourself are not quite the thing nerves only nerves he answered with what was almost a frightened look in his eyes dr nicola will set me right in no time i'm sure of that i've had a run of beastly luck lately it's upset me more than i can say i knew to what he referred but i did not betray my knowledge after that he bade me farewell and continued his walk that evening another exquisite basket of flowers arrived from miss trevor there was no card attached to it but as the duke denied all knowledge of it i felt certain as to whence it came 
on the day following for the first time since her illness miss trevor was able to leave the house and go for a short airing upon the canal we were rejoiced to take her and made arrangements for her comfort but there was one young man who was more attentive than all the rest of the party put together would miss trevor like another cushion is she quite sure that she was comfortable would she have preferred a gondola to a barker i said nothing but i wondered what the dean thought for he is an observant old gentleman as for the young lady herself she accepted the other's attentions with most charming good humour and thus all went merry as marriage bells on the day following she went out again on the afternoon of the next day felt so much stronger as to express a desire to walk for a short time on the piazza of st mark we accordingly landed at the well-known steps strolled slowly towards the cathedral it was a lovely afternoon the air being soft and warm with a gentle breeze blowing in from the sea it is needless for me to say that glenbarth was in the seventh heaven of delight and was already beginning to drop sundry little confidences into my ear her illness had ruined the opportunity he had hoped to have had but he was going to make up for it now indeed it looked very much as if she had last made up her mind concerning him but having had one experience of the sex i was not going to assure myself that all was satisfactory until a definite announcement was made by the lady herself as it turned out it was just as well that i did so for that afternoon not altogether unexpectedly i must confess was destined to prove the truth of the old saying that the course of true love never runs smooth miss trevor with the duke on one side and my wife on the other was slowly passing across the great square when a man suddenly appeared before us from one of the shops on our right this individual was none other than the don jose de martinos who raised his hat politely to the ladies and expressed his delight at seeing miss trevor abroad once more as usual he was faultlessly dressed and on the whole looked somewhat better in health than he had done when i had last seen him by some means i scarcely know how it was done he managed to slip in between my wife and miss trevor and in this order we made our way towards our usual resting place florian's cafe never since we had known him had the don exerted himself so much to please the duke however did not seem satisfied his high spirits had entirely left him and in consequence he was now as quiet as he had been talkative before it was plain to all of us that the don admired miss trevor and that he wanted her to become aware of the fact next morning he made an excuse and joined our party again at this the duke's anger knew no bounds personally i must confess that i was very sorry for the young fellow it was very hard upon him and just as he was progressing so favourably that another should appear upon the scene and distract the lady's attention yet there was only one way of ending it if only he could summon up sufficient courage to do it i fear however that he was either too uncertain as to the result or that he dreaded his fate should she consign him to the outer darkness too much to put it into execution for this reason he had to submit to sharing her smiles with the spaniard which if only he could have understood it was an excellent thing for his patience and a salutary trial for his character meanwhile my wife looked on in despair i thought it was all settled she said pathetically on one occasion and now they are as far off as ever why on earth does that troublesome man come between them because he has quite as much right to be there as the other i answered if the duke wants her let him ask her but that's just what he won't do the whole matter should have been settled by now it's all very well for you to say that she returned the poor boy would have done it before gertrude was taken ill but that you opposed him and a very proper proceeding too i answered miss trevor was under my charge and i was certainly not going to let any young man doubtless very desirable but who had only known her two days propose to her and get sent about his business render it impossible for our party to continue together and by so doing take all the pleasure out of our holiday so it was only of yourself you were thinking she returned with that wonderful inconsistency that is such a marked trait in her character why do you urge him now to do it because miss gertrude is no longer under my charge i answered her father is here and is able to look after her and an idea occurred to me and i acted upon it at once when you come to think of it my dear i said as if i had been carefully considering the question why should the don not make gertrude as good a husband as glenbarth he is rich 
and doubtless comes of a very good family and would certainly make a very presentable figure in society she stared at me aghast well she said in astonishment i must say that i think you are a loyal friend you know that the duke has set his heart upon marrying her and yet you are championing the cause of his rival i should never have thought it of you dick i hastened to assure her that i was not in earnest but for a moment i almost fancy she thought i was if you're on the duke's side i wonder that you encourage don martinos to continue his visit she went on after the other matter had been satisfactorily settled i cannot tell you how much i dislike him i feel that i would rather see gertrude married to a crossing sweeper than to that man how can she even tolerate him i do not know i find it very difficult to do so poor don i said he does not appear to have made very good impression in common justice i must admit so far as i am concerned he has been invariably extremely civil because he wants your interest you are the head of the house it's a pretty fiction let it pass however she pretended not to notice my jibe he's gambling away every halfpenny he possesses i regarded her with unfeigned astonishment how could she have become aware of this fact i put the question to her someone connected with the hotel told my maid philippa she answered they say he never returns to the hotel until between two and three in the morning he's not married i retorted she vouchsafed no remark to this speech but bidding me to keep my eyes open and beware lest there should be trouble between the two men left me to my own thoughts the warning she had given me was not a futile one for it needed only half an eye to see that glenbarth and martinos were desperately jealous of one another they eyed each other when they met as if at any moment they were prepared to fly at each other's throats once the duke's behaviour was such as to warrant my speaking to him upon the subject when we were alone together my dear fellow i said i must ask you to keep yourself in hand i don't like having to talk to you but i have to remember that there are ladies in the case and why on earth doesn't martinos keep out of my way he asked angrily you pitch into me for getting wild but don't you see how villainously rude he is to me he contradicts me as often as he can and for the rest of the time treats me as if i were a child in return you treat him as if he were an outsider and had no right to look at much less to speak to miss trevor nevertheless he is our friend or if he is not our friend he has at least been introduced to us by a friend now i have no desire that you should quarrel at all but if you must do so let it be when you are alone together and also when you are out of the hotel i had no idea how literally my words were to be taken that night according to a custom he had late adopted martinus put in an appearance after dinner and brought his guitar with him as he bade us good evening i looked at the duke's face it was pale and set as if he had had at last come to an understanding with himself presently my wife and i sang a duet together in a fashion that pointed very plainly to the fact that our thoughts were elsewhere miss trevor thanked us in a tone that showed me that she had also given but a small attention to our performance then gertrude sang a song of tosti's very prettily and was rewarded with enthusiastic applause after this the don was called upon to perform he took up his guitar and having tuned it struck a few chords and began to sing though i look back upon that moment now with real pain i must confess that i do not think i had ever heard him sing better the merry laughter of the song suited his voice to perfection it was plainly a comic ditty with some absurd imitations of a farmyard at the end of each verse when he had finished my wife politely asked him to give us a translation of the words fate willed that she should ask i suppose and also that he should answer it it is a story of a foolish young man who loved a fair maid he replied speaking with the utmost deliberation unfortunately however he was afraid to tell her of his love he pined to be with her yet whenever he was desirous of declaring his passion his courage failed him at the last moment and he was compelled to talk of the most commonplace things such as the animals upon his father's farm at last she tiring of such a laggard sent him away in disgust to learn how to woo in the meantime she married a man who was better acquainted with his business whether the song was exactly as he had described it i am not in a position to say the fact however remains that at least four of our party saw the insinuation and bitterly resented it i saw the duke's face flush and then go pale 
I thought for a moment he was going to say something, but he contented himself by picking up a book from the table by his side and glancing carelessly at it. I could guess by the way his hands gripped it, something of the storm that was raging in his breast. My wife, meanwhile, had turned the conversation into another channel by asking the dean what he had thought of a certain old church he had visited that morning. This gave a little relief, but not very much. Ten minutes later the don rose and bade us good night, with a sneer on his face. He even extended his good wish to the duke, who bowed but did not reply. When he had gone, my wife gave the signal for a general dispersal, and Glenbarth and I were presently left in the drawing-room alone. I half expected an immediate outburst, but to my surprise he said nothing on the subject. I had no intention of referring to it unless he did, and so the matter remained for the time in abeyance. After a conversation on general topics, lasting perhaps a quarter of an hour, we wished each other good night and retired to our respective rooms. When I entered my wife's room later, I was prepared for the discussion which I knew was inevitable. What do you think of your friend now? she asked, with a touch of sarcasm thrown into the word friend. You of course heard how he insulted the Duke. I noticed that he did a very foolish thing, not only for his own interests with us, but for several other reasons. You may rely upon it that if ever he had any chance with Gertrude, he never had the remotest chance. I can promise you that, my wife interrupted. I say, if ever he had a chance with Gertrude, he has lost it now. Surely that should satisfy you. It does not satisfy me that he should be rude to our guest at any time, but I am particularly averse to his insulting him in our presence. You need not worry yourself, I said, in all probability you will see no more of him. I shall convey a hint to him upon the subject. It will not be pleasant for Anstruther's sake. Mr. Anstruther should have known better than to have sent him to us, she replied. There is one thing I am devoutly thankful for, and that is that the Duke took it so beautifully. He might have been angry and have made a scene. Indeed, I should not have blamed him had he done so. I did not ask her for reasons of my own whether she was sure that his grace of Glenbarth was not angry. I must confess that I was rendered more uneasy by the quiet way he had taken it than if he had burst into an explosion. Concealed fires are invariably more dangerous than open ones. Next morning after breakfast, while we were smoking together in the balcony, a note was brought to Glenbarth. He took it, opened it, and when he had read the contents, thrust it hastily in his pocket. No answer, he said, as he lit a cigar, and I thought his hand trembled a little as he put the match to it. His face was certainly paler than usual, and there was a faraway look in his eyes that showed me that it was not the canal or the houses opposite that he was looking upon. There is something behind all of this. And I must find out what it is, I said to myself. Surely he can't be going to make a fool of himself. I knew, however, that my chance of getting anything satisfactory out of him lay in saying nothing about the matter just then. I must play my game in another fashion. What do you say if we run down to Rome next week? I asked after a little pause. My wife and Miss Trevor seemed to think they would enjoy it. There are lots of people we know there just now. I should be very pleased, he answered, but with a visible effort. At any other time, he would have jumped eagerly at the suggestion. Decidedly, there was something wrong. At luncheon, he was preoccupied so much that I could see Miss Trevor wondered what was the matter. Had she known the terrible suspicion that was growing in my own mind, I wonder what she would have said, and also how she would have acted. That afternoon, the ladies resolved to remain at home, and the dean decided to stay with them. In consequence, the duke and I went out together. He was still as quiet as he had been in the morning, but as yet I had not been able to screw up my courage to such a pitch as to be able to put the question to him. Once, however, I asked the reason for his quietness, and received the evasive reply that he was not feeling quite up to the mark that day. This time I came a little nearer to the point. You're not worrying about that wretched fellow's rudeness, I hope, I said, looking him fairly and squarely in the face. Not in the least, he answered. Why should I be? Well, because I know you are hot-tempered, I returned, rather puzzled to find an explanation for him. Oh, I'll have it out with him at some time or other, I have no doubt, he continued, and then changed the subject by referring to some letters he had from home that day. When we later returned to the hotel for afternoon tea, we found the two ladies eagerly awaiting our coming. 
from the moment that he entered the room miss trevor was graciousness itself to the young man she smiled upon him encouraged him until he scarcely knew whether he was standing upon his head or his heels i fancy she was anxious to compensate him for the don's rudeness to him that evening we all complained of feeling tired and accordingly went to bed early i was the latest of the party and my own man had not left my dressing-room more than a minute before he returned with the information that the duke's valet would be glad if he could have a few words with me send him in i said forthwith the man made his appearance what is it henry i inquired is your master not well i don't know what's wrong with his grace sir the man replied i'm very much frightened about him and i thought i would come to you at once why what is the matter he seemed well enough when i bade him good night half an hour ago it isn't that sir he's well enough in his body said the man there's something else behind it all i know sir you won't mind my coming to you i didn't know what else to do you better tell me everything and i shall know how to act what do you think is the reason of it well sir it's like this henry went on his grace has been very quiet all day he wrote a lot of letters this morning and put them in his dispatch box i'll tell you what i'll do with them later henry he said when he had finished well i didn't think very much of that but when to-night he asked me what i'd made up in my mind to do with myself if ever i should leave his service and told me that he had put it down in his will that i was to have five hundred pounds if he should die before i left him i began to think there was something the matter well sir i took his things to-night and was in the act of leaving the room when he called me back go out early for a swim in the sea to-morrow morning he said but i shan't say anything to sir richard hatteras about it because i happen to know that he thinks the currents about here are dangerous well one never knows what might turn up he goes on to say and if by any chance henry though i hope such a thing will not happen i should be caught and should not return i want you to give this letter to sir richard but remember this you are on no account to touch it till midday do you understand i told him not i did but i was so frightened by what he said that i made up my mind to come and see you at once this was disturbing intelligence indeed from what he said there could be no doubt that the don and glenbarth contemplated fighting a duel in that case what was to be done to attempt to reason with the duke in his present humour would be absurd besides his honour was at stake and though i am totally against duels that counts for something i'm glad you told me this henry i said for now i shall know how to act don't worry about your master's safety he's safe in my hands he shall have his swim to-morrow morning and i shall take very good care that he is watched you may go to bed with an easy heart and don't think about that letter it will not be needed for he will come to no harm the man thanked me civilly and withdrew considerably relieved in his mind by his interview with me then i sat myself down to think the matter out what was i to do doubtless the don was an experienced duellist or glenbarth though a very fair shot with a rifle or fowling piece would have no chance against him with a pistol or a sword it was by no means an enviable position to be placed in and i fully realized my responsibility in the matter i felt that i needed help but to whom should i apply for it the dean would be worse than useless while to go to the don and ask him to sacrifice his honour to our friendship for glenbarth would be to run the risk of being shown the door then i thought of nikola and made my mind up to go to him at once since the duke had spoken of leaving the hotel early in the morning there could be no doubt as to the hour of the meeting in that case there was no time to be lost i thereupon went to explain matters to my wife i had a suspicion this would happen she said when she had heard me out oh dick you must stop it without fail i should never forgive myself if anything were to happen to him while he is our guest go to dr nikola at once and tell him everything and implore him to help us as he has helped us before thus encouraged i left her and went back to my dressing-room to complete my attire this done i descended to the hall to endeavour to obtain a gondola good fortune favoured me for the american party who had but lately arrived at the hotel had just returned from the theatre i engaged the man who had brought them and told him to take me to the palace of Vici with all possible speed it's a late hour signor he replied i'd rather go anywhere than to that house in the rio di consiglio you'll be well paid for your trouble and also for your fear i replied as i got into the boat next moment we were on our way a light was burning in nicola's room as we drew up at the palace steps i bade the gondolier wait for me and to ensure his doing so I refused to pay him until my return then i rang the bell and was rewarded in a few minutes 
by hearing Nicholas's footsteps on the flagstones of the courtyard. When the door opened, he was vastly surprised at seeing me. He soon recovered his equilibrium, however. It took more than a small surprise to upset Nicola. He invited me to enter. I hope there is nothing wrong, he said politely, or otherwise how am I to account for this late call? Something is very wrong indeed, I said. I have come to consult you and to ask for your assistance. By this time he had reached his own room, that horrible room I remembered so well. The fact of the matter is, I said, seating myself in the chair he offered me as I spoke, the Duke of Glenbarth and Don Di Martinos have arranged to fight a duel soon after daybreak. To fight a duel, Nicholas repeated. So it's come to this, has it? Well, what do you want me to do? Surely it is needless for me to say, I replied. I want you to help me stop it. You like the Duke, I know. Surely you will not allow that brave young life to be sacrificed by that Spaniard. From the way you speak, it would appear that you do not care for Martinos, Nicholas replied. Frankly confess that I do not, I replied. He was introduced to me by a personal friend, but none of my party care very much for him. And now this new affair only adds to our dislike. He insulted the Duke most unwarrantably in my drawing room last night, and this duel is the result. Uh, always the same, always the same, Nicola muttered to himself. But the end is coming, and his evil deeds will bear their own fruit. And turning to me, he said aloud, Since you wish it, I will help you. Don Jose is a magnificent shot, and he will place a bullet in the Duke's anatomy wherever he may choose to receive it. The issue would never for one moment be in doubt. How do you know that Don is such a good shot? I inquired with considerable surprise, for until the moment that I had introduced him to each other, I had no idea that they had ever met. I know more about him than you think, he answered, fixing his glittering eyes upon me. But now to business. If they fight at daybreak, there's not much time to be lost. He went to his writing table at the other side of the room and wrote a few lines on a sheet of note paper. Placing it in an envelope, he inquired whether I had told my gondolier to wait. Upon my answering in the affirmative, he left me and went down the stairs. What have you done? I inquired when he returned. I've sent word to an agent I sometimes employ, he said. He will keep his eyes open. Now you'd better get back to your hotel and to bed. Sleep secure on my promise that the two men shall not fight. When you are called, take the gondola you will find awaiting you outside the hotel, and I will meet you at a certain place. Now let me wish you a good night. He conducted me to the hall below, and saw me into the gondola, and saying something to the gondolier that I did not catch, he bade me adieu, and I returned to the hotel. Punctually at five o'clock I was awakened by a tapping on my bedroom door. I dressed, donned a cloak, for the morning was cold, and descended to the hall. The night watchman informed me that a gondola was awaiting me at the steps, and conducted me to it. Without a word I got in, and the little craft shot out into the canal. We entered a narrow street on the other side. It took two or three turnings to right and then left, and at last came to a standstill at some steps that I had never noticed before. A tall figure wrapped in a black cloak was awaiting us there. It was Nicola. Entering the gondola, he took his place at my side, and once more we set off. At the same moment, so Nicola informed me, Glen Bath was leaving the hotel. End of chapter 10